am a I was in Salute Your Shorts last year and won their prize for, so I'm just really excited to take part and do the Q&A for you guys this year. So um, I have two directors. I never picked from the film, I never picked Cotton. So I'll just have them introduce themselves and their relationship to the film. So um, my name is Nam Gwing Lei, I go by Q. I was a director and the main editor on I Never Pick Cotton. And my name is Hannah Adams, and I was a director as well as the sound designer for I Never Picked Cotton. Awesome. So I saw online that there were 12 directors. And I, and so for me, I'm just wondering how you guys got through the creative process together and um, how were the strategies in order to um, get through just 12 directors to tell this one story. So if you guys can tell me about that process, that'd be great. Um, and Hannah, we would, we had like these weekly meetings of our class, right? And it was just always a very collaborative process in terms of, um, well, first we start with meditation, which is helpful. And then we would talk about what we wanted to do from day one. Um, and then just the process was just a lot of discussions about what was and candid discussions about what was and what wasn't working. And Hannah, like you gave me, I was looking at some old notes that you gave me in terms of the sound. I know they were so good because you were like, you know, you would send me these notes of like, hey, can you have this mm and ah, like specifically at like this time stamp. Um, and it was just like these types of notes that were really candid and really um, helpful. Yeah, and I think kind of going off of that, I think like from the beginning, I think the biggest thing, the biggest reason why it worked with so many people was because we had a very like thorough thought out plan. Like our storyboards were very um, specific in terms, like we kind of knew where the film was going before we got started, if that makes sense. And so like it, the, this film came out of a class, right? where all 12 of the people in the class were directing it. So because it was in this like class environment where like learning and growing like was um, encouraged, I think that that's why we had the opportunity to work so well together. Okay, brilliant. Um, one thing I thought was poignant was your documentary subject talked about children not seeing race. So at what point did each of you recall realizing your own races? Um, I think it was, I was, you know, I, I was, I'm Vietnamese, so I'm already an ethnic minority um, within an Asian population, which is a racial minority in the, you know, United States. So I was pretty aware quite early. Um, my parents are refugees as well, so I was just growing up, I knew, I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm not white. It's pretty obvious. I grew up speaking nothing but Vietnamese until they threw me in the kindergarten and said, learn English, and that was it. Um, but I think in terms of um, outright racism, I only really understood what systemic racism does when I was playing soccer. I grew up, you know, I, I love soccer, but I was pretty much the only Asian kid on any soccer team. Or no, sorry. I was I also like to say for anyone who's not in the U.S., soccer is real football <laughs> in the rest of the world. Um, but yeah, so and you know it was I re and you know it was one of those things where you know I would often get targeted by other players doing super illegal moves like slide tackling from behind, kicking me in the head when the referee wasn't watching, and they would never call it. They would never say anything, um, and I would have to work super hard at practice to maybe you know, get placed. So I think that was one of those moments when I realized I'm like, hey, I'm the only Asian kid, I'm getting targeted by these other players who are very clearly white and nothing's happening. But if I accidentally tap them, I get a yellow card. So that was, I was pretty young when I recognized it. Yeah, and um, uh, I also, Q, thank you for sharing that. But also, so for me, you know, I'm very, very white passing, you know, even my name is very white passing. So I have near faced almost completely Arabic. 
Um, so, you know, and I don't know my dad's family very well at all. Um, so, you know, Arabic culture is something that's very near and dear to my heart because that's kind of all I know. Um, and for me, the, the, when I realized that like my, like Arabic culture or like my family was different was in first grade, somebody sneezed and I said, smala, which is the Arabic word for bless you, because that's just how my family operated. And the teacher thought I said something else. I don't know what she thought I said, I think, but I got in a ton of trouble and I was like, I, I, I don't know, like why? Like I didn't do anything. So after that, I started to get called a terrorist by all my classmates because I was Arabic. So it's just one of those things where like, I, I realized pretty early on that being Arabic was not something that was valued by society. And especially since 9-11, you know, even my parents, you know, I was named Hana, but after 9-11, they were like, okay, it's Hannah. Like it's, it's, so they switched my name so that it didn't sound Arabic so that so it's just it's little things like that that I experienced but like again like what I've experienced is like nowhere near what I realized like the racial discrimination that you know other people who are not white passing experience on a daily basis so thank you for I both being so generous with um your frankness there uh with that question um, that's a perfectly uh, segue into my next question. With such a diverse creative group from people from different racial backgrounds, um, how did you decide on Yolanda's experience as the subject matter for the doc? So the Black experience over, say, an Arab experience or a Latino experience or an Asian experience, which would all have its own nuances, obviously, for just how different um, the races are perceived. So just why, what was the editing process for deciding on a Black experience? Yeah, um, one of the first days we all like of class, I, it might have even been the first day, so Q can fact check me on that, but um, we all pitched an idea that we wanted to create an animated documentary about. Um, Yolanda pitched this idea and we all voted and I would say like I, I voted for it, like we all like a lot of people really wanted this to be something that we focused on, especially because she is such like a dynamic person and her voice would have been used so well in this documentary. So I think that that's, you know, like it was, a, it was a collective decision. <laughs> yeah, no, it was the first day pretty much we, everyone pitched and, you know, Yolanda's really calm too. So she's telling these stories when we interviewed her and she's telling her story, these are horrific stories. I don't know, you know, what, you know, cause a lot of it didn't make it into the three minute cut, but she was just very calm. So I think that her voice and her calm, you know, juxtaposed to just a horrific nature of the story she was telling us was, you know, made her the clear, you know, pick for who we we're going to interview. Okay, that makes sense. Um, my next one is, um, my next question is going to be more technical. So um, with you decided as a collective to mix techniques up and how did you make the imagery tie together to a cohesive whole? So how did you do that editing process? That was definitely actually a, so Josie and Tian are um, two other students help storyboard. We spent a whole class storyboarding. Um, so before we started animating and editing and everything, but, um, or yeah, so, one of the imagery that was that someone came up, I'm pretty sure it was Victoria, was the idea of cotton, um, like a cotton field and that sort of imagery and the hand uh, imagery as well, sort of the almost, I think we were half joking, it's the hand of God um, that would pick up, uh, that sort of came out of nowhere and took control of things. So putting basically Yolanda's character in a lack of, con a space of a lack of control sort of like the imagery of, you know, cotton, that even though she's not born during the time of slavery in the United States, you know, she still comes from that legacy. So this sort of overwhelming imagery of cotton and even just the different ways it was drawn um, and the hand as well. That's one of the ways we tied it together. Um, Hannah, I think you, I feel like I'm missing something. It's, it's been a while. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um... I think what you said was great, cute. Not that you're missing anything, but yeah, it has been a while. Um, I think so. In the class, we were we separated into four groups, and we each essentially had like 
30 to 45 seconds of the film that we had to animate. So we really focused on the transition points. Like I feel like there was one person in every group that focused on the transition points from like one section to another. And I think the other thing is like Q, for example, was able to edit the entire like lay down of the audio and what order everything was going to go in like without having to like break that up into sections like that was all one cohesive piece and then when I did the sound design that was also all one cohesive piece so like there were elements that were a little choppy because we did it in segments but then there were these overarching things of like the editing and the sound that kind of as well as like the transition pieces that we focused on that kind of helped it like flow all together so that it seems like very cohesive. Yeah, the transitions are key. That was the key to my film when I did the an animated documentary too. And then just doing that animated, like it's all on the transitions when you're changing technique for sure. So I relate to that. Well, those are my questions that I have for you. Um, congratulations on getting in such a great festival and thank you so much for meeting with me and having this conversation. It was delightful. Yeah, thank you as well.